And Lord, may we not worry about what I am to say, because you will give the words through the Holy Spirit. And may we all rest, not on our own testimonies, but on what you will give us to share with those around us about your gospel, as we share it with all the nations, especially the digital nation. We pray these things in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it is a bit of a chilling gospel passage that we have today. We encounter Jesus first at the temple, telling about the destruction of that temple, which historically we know happened in 70 AD, so a good 40 years after he first foretold it. But then we have this conversation that happens with the disciples at the Mount of Olives. They were very concerned about what Jesus had said about the temple, and they wanted to know more. When is this going to happen? What can we look out for? What is this about? And Jesus doesn't just talk about the destruction of the temple, the physical temple, but actually begins to talk about natural disasters, about wars, about famines. And he describes all these things as the birth pangs. Now, I don't know how you feel about the image of God as a mother, something definitely some of our holy hermits can help us with, especially Julian of Norwich. But also this concept of God as being both mother and midwife is one that we could perhaps sit with today with this passage. Birthing a new thing, growing and working towards something that is not yet but is to come imminently, and perhaps birthing a new era into being through change and transformation, but also through tumult. This seems to be what Christ is describing. And the disciples certainly must have been quite alarmed as they were hearing this, because not only does Jesus talk about these signs, but also talks about what is to happen to those who follow him. They will have to give an account of their faith before the rulers, before the powers, and perhaps be persecuted because of it. There is not an easy path ahead. And so why do we have these passages in particular today? At this point in our church year, we're only a few weeks away from Advent beginning and moving into a new calendar for the church cycle and there we will, of course, begin preparing for the coming of Christ in our midst in that symbolic way that we remember at Christmas. Well, there's always the other side to Advent, which is talking about Christ's return and second coming, not just born as a human in Nazareth or of Nazareth in Bethlehem 2000 years ago, but returning as the Christ who will bring the new era into being at the end of the world as we know it. So there's foreshadowing happening here. And Jesus is being quite clear that this is going to be something that happens not very swiftly. It's not going to be, bing, Jesus is back, ta-da. It's going to take a lot of pain and change and possibly suffering before that happens. So Keeping with this concept of God as mother, as well as midwife, one that is involved in the growing of, transforming, changing, and then birthing of new things, we also have in our Old Testament passage, and in place of our psalm today, the song of Hannah. Now, Hannah's story is one which definitely has some problematic parts to it. Her story of barrenness to plenty, of despair to joy, and her faithfulness in the face of doubt is one that it's good for us to sit with while we think about what Jesus is talking about in the end times. So in the Old Testament, it was quite common for men to have more than one wife, and this is what we encounter here. Elkanah had Hannah, but also had another wife who had given plenty of children. Hannah, as yet, had not been able to conceive and give birth to a child. So in the scriptures, it's unclear which wife he married first, but we do know that unlike what would be expected culturally, 
Elkanah loves Hannah, gives honour to Hannah and is constantly looking to nourish her, nurture her and cherish her, even though Penina is the one who has given him children. Penina, unfortunately, is said to be the rival that then gives Hannah pain, so it can't have been a super happy household, but we know that often Hannah would take her pain to the temple and by doing that, take it to God. And this is the thing that I think we can really focus on here. So her response is profoundly different than perhaps the responses of other women in the Old Testament who had infertility as part of their experience. First, we had Sarah, the wife of Abraham, then Rebecca, wife of Isaac, and Rachel, wife of Jacob. All of them often were not doing what Hannah did. They were definitely waiting for God to act, but not by going so faithfully to temple or to a place of prayer. And Hannah actually weeps and is constantly in prayer, so much so that the priest in the temple, Eli, thinks that she is drunk. He says, when are you going to put away your wine, woman? Honestly, you're muttering under your breath constantly in temple. It's quite distracting, actually. But Hannah is not drunk, which she then reveals to Eli. She is desperately praying to God out of her anxiety and out of her pain, longing for a child, longing for this promise, longing for her prayers to be answered. She took her pain to the only one who could alleviate it, God. So in her anguish, we know that she it's recorded, she said, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Now, what she means by that, of course, is that she will dedicate her son to temple life and to eventually become one of the religious leaders, perhaps a priest. The song that we had in place of our psalm today is an interesting one then, knowing that Hannah's prayers were answered, that she was able to commit Samuel to the temple. And we know what happened for Samuel and Eli later on. Samuel is the boy who heard God's voice audibly while asleep at night, three times going to Eli saying, hello, master, you called me. So we know that Samuel's purpose and destiny is quite essential to the story of Israel. But Hannah, his mother, she sings this song, praying under her breath repeatedly in temple. This song then expresses more of this longing and this hope that she carries within her. And this is the song. I'm going to read it. So if you'd like to close your eyes, if that helps you to absorb, please feel welcome. It is quite poetic in the way that it is phrased. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no holy one like you, O Lord, nor any rock like you, our God. For you are a God of knowledge, and by you our actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full now search for bread, but those who are hungry are well fed. The barren woman has borne sevenfold, but she who has many children is forlorn. Both the poor and the rich are of your making. You bring low and you also exalt. You raise up the poor from the dust and lift the needy from the ash heap. You make them sit with the rulers and inherit a place of honour. For the pillars of the earth are yours, and on them you have set the world. Now, obviously, interesting is the section where she says, the barren woman has borne sevenfold, but she who has many children is forlorn. I wonder if that's just because the mother who has many, many children is a little bit sleep deprived. Perhaps <laughs> we could giggle about that a little bit. But maybe this is also alluding to the topsy-turvy kingdom that Jesus is constantly preaching about in his ministry and alluding to the kingdom of God truly being 
different to what we experience here when people have power and success and what that does, that dynamic often leads to corruption. But in the kingdom of God, which Hannah reaches forward to from this place where she is waiting and hoping in God's promises, she notes that the poor are raised up from the dust, the needy are lifted from the ash heap. And they get to sit with the rulers and inherit a place of honor where systems are unequal and unequitable. In the topsy turvy kingdom of God, not only will roles be reversed to see justice happen, but there'll also be a little bit more of a level playing field. Now, that's something that we can look forward to and reach towards ourselves as we are involved in perhaps birthing or aiding in the birth of that kingdom. So let's go back to the gospel passage now, back to the disciples hearing about the coming disasters and what Jesus is saying to them about the future. Now, there's some advice that Jesus gives after saying this is what's going to happen and you need to be alert and aware because there will be opportunities for you to be led astray. There'll be people who are intentionally doing this or maybe not even intentionally. So what he advises the disciples is to keep on task. I love it. So clear. Don't worry, you're busy. <laughs> if you have time to worry about all these disasters, just return to your mission. He says the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. And then he gives advice as to how they're to go about doing this. When they bring you to trial and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Okay, no pressure. Not only have the disciples been led into the know about quite a disastrous future just before Jesus' return, but also given the most important job to make sure that all the nations, every corner of the earth has had the opportunity to also become aware. Now, the good news is what Jesus calls it. How do we wrap good news up in the knowledge that life is not going to be easier if you follow Christ? How do we share this good news, which is good, it is good, but with this extra part of all of these disasters that will before us, before Jesus returns to make all things well. It's interesting that the emphasis is not on preparation then. We humans like to prepare. Certainly it's a natural tendency for us when we know there's a storm coming. Okay, have we got all our supplies? Where's the emergency box? Where's our emergency checklist and plan? Have we got it all ticked off? Risk assessments. Oh, what a joy. We do these things to try and stop disasters from happening. There's certainly a movement always for us to be ready, be prepared. And yet that's not what Christ is telling us to do. And we are supposed to rely on the Holy Spirit to give us the words to speak, but also to provide for us in this era that we live through, to guide us in our witness as well as in our lives, where we take some of the emphasis off of what we can do and just trust that when we're engaging in God's work, it will be God who provides. Just like Hannah, when she was waiting desperately, but waiting for God to act. So we're not to become paralyzed by fear. That's also another tendency that we humans have. We can over-prepare, but we can also just get absolutely stop, stop everything, paralyze, lay flat. There's no point. It's going to be hard. We don't want to sign up for that. We're not just to wait for the end. We are to keep busy. So diligence in sharing the good news. What does that really look like? Proclaiming the gospel because we must make sure that all nations have had the chance to join in the kingdom before it comes in its fullness. Well, there's an extra exhortation in our epistle reading today for the Hebrews originally, but perhaps also for us. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised 
is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So confession of our hope without wavering. And that is not because we are faithful, but it is because the one who has promised is faithful, Jesus. And provoking one another, that's a funny word. It's one which often we attach to conflict, but provoking one another, stirring up with one another, encouraging one another to love and to good deeds, which is, of course, the fruit of love. And not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. I wonder who they're talking about there, anyway. But encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. So if our anxiety gets quite strong when there's natural disaster, which is always part of our lives, or if we see war breaking out around us and we think, my goodness, is the end coming? And that is one that definitely is there for us to consider, especially as weaponry gets so advanced. Also thinking about the other signs that can come, those who say, follow me, follow me, I know the way, and they are not Jesus. So provoking one another in this environment, encouraging one another, meeting together, and moving towards love together. So how do we think about the times that we live in now and that urgency to push us to share the good news in our own lives? Is it there? Because obviously for the disciples, they might have thought, my goodness, these things are going to happen in a couple of years in our lifetime and the earth will be recreated and made new. Well, 2,000 years, yep, that's a long time. Have we uh, perhaps not felt that urgency as much? Or actually, do we look around at, at the world around us and go, actually, yep, yeah, we really need to be working hard on our loving and on our proclamation of the good news and our good deeds. So thinking now about proclaiming that to all the nations, we online are doing ministry and mission to the digital nation, which includes all of us as we gather in a virtual space but also the wide expanse of what I call the final frontier of mission. We might have scoured the earth and gone to all sorts of places to share the good news, but we can be in all places at once using technology online. Bit daunting perhaps, but how do we do this work, proclaiming that good news and standing firm in our faith in such a way that we attract others? towards not us, but towards Jesus, especially if they are unfamiliar with the creator who loves them intimately. How can we share this in the online space, which also has its own disasters and risks and birth pangs going on? Well, I'm gonna leave us with that question. It's one which it would be good for us to keep considering because we need to live the question, not just have a clever answer although some would look to us to have that answer. With that in mind, there are a couple of words from our Holy Hermit today, which I think might help us. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity in her young life certainly had doubts of her own. We have recorded that she had both highs in faith as well as lows in faith when those around her in the Carmelite order were a bit worried about her. But this is one of the things that she left for us these words that perhaps can encourage us as we do this work. Believe that God loves you and wants to help you in the struggles which you must undergo. Believe in God's love, God's exceeding love. So let us not worry about what we are to say or what we are to do but rest on the Holy Spirit who is with us, just as Jesus is with us. And as we await the end, there's plenty for us to do as we perhaps act as midwives ourselves to God the Mother who is birthing a new way and a new existence and one that is eternal and is even better and more good than what we see here and now. Believe that God loves you. 
and wants to help you. Amen.